Okay. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, so for today's Astro Seminar, uh, we have doctors uh, Gregory Pool and Simon O'Toole, uh, who kindly offered to inform us about the services provided by the ADAX, so the Astronomy Data and Compute Services, and the Opticon Data Center. So please go ahead, Greg and Simon, um, and may the fourth be with you. <laughs> thank you, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, my name is Greg Poole, and I'm the coordinator of the ADAX program at Swinburne. Um, I'll get into kind of what ADAX is and, and how we're structured and all that sort of stuff in a minute. Um, but I just wanted to comment that um, the program I'm going to be talking about today, just sort of the uh, expression, the call for expressions of interest just closed. So it's a bit late to engage in the program for the semester that's, that's being called for now. But I do want to advertise one new wrinkle to the program that we're hoping to introduce in the coming month or so. And that is we're going to sort of start a program of doing kind of rolling audits through the year. Um, AAL has approved that initiative. So um, I'll talk about that in a little bit later. So even though the, the main program that I'm going to talk about today is, is maybe something for you to keep in mind for six months from now. Um, the broader program is something that you'll be able to engage in um, soon over the next month or so if you have a large program that you want us to sit down and, and take a good look at. Um, also, it's worth noting that Monash has been pretty successful through uh, the ADAX program. And I can see that there's a few successful applicants here with us today, but there's also a bunch of people that I'm, I'm glad to see that, that I have names that I'm, I'm not familiar with. So hopefully uh, some of you will be watching this with an eye towards, oh yeah, that maybe this is how, maybe this could fit uh, my science program and hopefully we'll be seeing applications from you again uh, soon. Okay, so ADAX, the background. Who are we and, and, and kind of, What's the, what's the background? So the vision for, for ADAX is astronomy focused training um, and support and we, we, we provide expertise for, um, the whole idea here is to maximize the scientific return on investments for all the computing infrastructure that the astronomy community in this country has already made. So we've laid out money um, for OSTAR and, and for, uh, for other facilities and hardware around the country. The idea here is to make sure that we're making the most use of those, of those resources. Towards that end, there's three service components. One is training, um, and that comes in various forms. It's, it's us you know, running face-to-face -face seminars or webinars or putting together um, YouTube videos or, or uh, hosting internships. Um, the other is support for the OSTAR supercomputer. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, there's a, a cluster at Swinburne that every single astronomer in this country is entitled to an account on. It's a rubber stamp. Uh, it's super easy to get an account. Um, and then once you've got an account, it's super easy to get a, a seed project set up. You instantly and automatically get 10 terabytes of disk space with those projects. And it's all basically just a rubber stamp. So if you're struggling to get your laptop or the or the kind of workstations that, that Monash have, have provided you with. If you're struggling to get your science through those machines at the moment, please think about using OSTAR. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty let's say fair system. It's pretty easy to get, get onto and get running with. And we're here to help you do that. And then the last is what I mostly want to talk about today. And that's uh, our national support program. So, this mainly comes in the form of professional software support. Um, it also comes in helping to manage the Aztec um, Astronomy Supercomputing Time Allocation Committee. That's the committee through which you're able to get large blocks of time on clusters in this country. And also we manage the data management uh, and collaboration platform. That's a, a way to host small and medium sized data sets um, so if you've got a small or medium sized data set that you would like to share with the world and, and have some provenance and, and some longevity to, maybe you want to tag it in a journal. And in fact, we have a, an ongoing arrangement with PASA whereby 
you, you can get data sets that are important to pass up publications hosted automatically on, on the system. You get a, a DOI attached to that data set so that people can cite your data set and you can collect citations for, for data sets. So think of that system if, if you have of need of any of that kind of functionality. Index is made up of two nodes, uh, one here at Swinburne. We're principally responsible for all the software uh, support and another node at West at Curtin and they're principally responsible for training, but they do some software support and we do some training. Um, operations commenced uh, March of 2017. So we've been at this for about three years now, or four years now, sorry. And we are funded by AAL ultimately through an, an NCURS allocation. Uh, so the merit, Merit Allocation Program is sort of the flagship program that I wanted to advertise here and make sure everybody was aware of. Um, the idea here is it's a lot like a telescope or a supercomputing um, application, only instead of getting time on a telescope or time on a supercomputer, you're getting time, the time of a developer to help you with your software development needs. Now that could be, um, sort of optimizing or extending the features of a, of a new, uh, of, a, of an existing code base or, um, or laying down the, the, the foundation and the first features of a whole new um, project. So the, methodol the methodol <laughs> methodology of the program uh, is this. So we've tried to template it pattern it after a, a telescope proposal or a computing type proposal. But the real difference here is it's not reasonable for us to expect you guys to know how much of our time is going to be needed to do the work. So because of that, we have to change the, the setup a little bit and refront load the process with this EOI process, which as I said, is just closed for the next round. So you, what, the idea here is you submit a one page document and it's really just intended to kick off a conversation with us. It shouldn't be any kind of barrier to entry. It's just, hey, this is my idea. It's not, it's not a commitment that you will submit a proposal. And it's not a commitment that that's exactly what you're going to do. It's just meant to seed a conversation. So we'll get that um, application in. We'll then, that'll then kick, uh, be used to uh, initiate a conversation uh, we'll sit down and interview you about the project and, and, and what you've got in mind. We'll kind of come to an agreement of, of what kind of work we think fits with the program and, and what fits in within the scope of a, of a semester. Um, and then we sit down, ADAX, and sit down and we come up with an assessment of how much work it is. And otherwise, from, from your perspective, it, it's exactly the same as a telescope proposal. You sit down, we have an online system. You know, you'll say, we've tried to make it as lean as possible. We're not asking for your, you know, an updated list of citations and, and publications. We're trying to keep it as, the process as lean as possible. And you'll submit that online. The only difference is, is there'll be a paragraph of text that we'll give you that you need to cut and paste into the proposal saying how much work is involved. Um, and then it goes off to an independent committee. They've been asked to assess the proposals based on scientific merit and impact. And you know, then the results come back. Um, and here's a URL here if you want to see a little bit more details about exactly how the process works. Now I said we do training. I just want to back up a little bit on that and say, you know, ADEX does a whole host of different um, training activities as well, um, and I, I list these here. Um, I do want to highlight that we generate a lot of sort of uh, le learning management system content for our online web, so for our homepage. So hanging off for our web page is a learning management system. This has got a host, I, I should go and, and check how many now, but we've got dozen or tens now of small tutorials on things like SQL or AstroPy or um, just using a um, computing cluster, um, you know, what the login node is and what compute nodes are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
all the sort of um, sort of technologies that that astronomers are expected to or may be expected to know in the in the arc of their research career we've tried to kind of come up with uh, tutorials for a lot of this material is is hosted on our YouTube page so if you want to just go and search ADAX learning on YouTube you'll find a lot of this material there but certainly the most up-to-date um, list of content is on the on the ADEX homepage. Um, and I want to highlight this to all those supervisors of young graduate students. This is a great place to send your young graduate students and say, look, as you come across technologies in, in the course of your work, this is a good place to go and just get a, a, a high level first cut at what these things are that you're that you're encountering. So I encourage um, supervisors to send their students here early on to kind of level set them a little bit with the technologies that we use in astronomy. And of course we host all our code on GitHub and we run an internship program and we curate online resources. Also through the merit allocation program we offer training now and I, I want to really emphasize this now. We are excited about this. This is a way for ADEX to get a good handle on exactly what your training needs are. We could, you know, we could send a survey out, but lots of research shows now that surveys are pretty limited are in what they're able to do. So surveys are good at getting people's opinions on things, but they aren't very good at getting a handle on what people actually want or need. Um, people tend to not really have a good idea of what they want and need, and that's not any kind of criticism. It's just the nature of, it's just human nature that we don't always know exactly what we need. But if you reformat the question and say, look, we'll give you a bunch of time, what would you do with it? Um, and get people thinking actively about uh, an offer like that, then you start to see new ideas emerging. So. This is a way for us to try to generate a real temperature of what the training needs of this community are. So please think about this program. We are giving away training time and we want you guys to come up with what your needs are. If you've got a, a group of graduate students that are all contributing to a code base and those contributions are colliding and stepping on each other and breaking each other, maybe you need some training around how to collaborate around a code base. Um, that might involve helping you set up uh, a testing harness for the code base, CI, you know, some sort of automated testing regime, um, even just the etiquette of, of working with GitHub. Um, maybe you, um, or, or, and also it's worth emphasizing that this training can be attached to a software support projects. So maybe you want us to GPU optimize a code base for you. We can do that, but then we can also attach some training to that, to that project so that we can train you up on how to maintain that code base yourself. Um, so insert your own training ideas here. Um, we're keen to hear from you. So yeah, so just a, uh, some examples of what those training ideas could be. You could uh, we run a workshop that we've already done, but we could tweak it for your own needs. Um, we could put together a self-paced tutorial for you if you want to just sort of level set your uh, onboard your graduate students. Or yeah, we can attach training to to software support projects or other. Sky's the limit. Come up with good ideas for us, please. Um, but the bread and brother, bread and butter of the merit allocation program, of course, is software support. Um, just to give you an idea of, of what the, the group at Swinburne at least is and what we can and can't do. Uh, we now are on the order of 20 professional software developers um, covering, and we've had tried to hire for breadth of knowledge. So um, are the skills cover just about everything you could imagine. So from web development to scientific computing, so optimizing an HPC code base, 
machine learning and data science, um, scientific visualization, even we've developed a mobile app now. So um, quite just about anything you can think of, we will be comfortable doing. Um, we've had IRAF proposals in the past, please don't send us IRAF proposals, but I suppose we could do that too. Um, and just in terms of the sort of culture of the group and, and our makeup, we're um, basically a 50-50 split of people coming from traditional software engineering backgrounds and, and sort of technically savvy astronomers. So that ensures an adequate amount of domain knowledge so that we can talk with you and, and sit down and talk in the language of astronomy and make sense of the projects that you're looking at in your language. But also we've got um, trained UX expertise within the group now. So we've found ourselves developing a lot of web applications, for instance, and we now have the tech, um, the skills in-house to make sure that those products that we're develop, developing are developed to a professional standard. Um, and certified agile product discovery and delivery people within the group to make sure that the projects are managed and delivered on time and on budget and efficiently and professionally. Here's a list now, uh, complete up to last semester of all the projects that we've offered through the Merit Allocation Program here. Um, you can kind of browse this list uh, afterwards. So I'll send the, the slides along. The points I want to make here are a real kind of mix of web development projects, optimization projects, mobile apps, and yes, now we're offering training. Um, so um, yeah, so real mix of projects across a really wide um, range of, of disciplines. So talking points that we could uh, discuss during, during questions afterwards, if you want. Um, questions like, um, so we're developing all these web applications. Um, and so what's, what's going on with that? And, and it, this was a bit of a surprise to us early in the program that we were getting all these web applications. And um, it actually kind of makes a bit of sense when you think about it. Um, you know, astronomers historically have found ways to get a talented graduate student to help them GPU optimize codes and stuff like that. It's hard and you can't always do it and stuff like that, but we've managed to do it. But um, web applications, the, the Venn diagrams of the skills involved in writing a web application and optimizing a scientific code base don't overlap very well. Um, and But it doesn't mean that there hasn't been a lot of very good ideas in lying latent in the community for a long time. So. When this program started, I think there was a, a, a whole bunch of kind of web application ideas living in the permafrost. Um, and they sort of came up at, at when, when the opportunity arose. So um, yeah, so that's made, meant that we've had to scramble to make sure that we can do these projects to a, to a high standard. So questions like who is, owns and is responsible for the code developed? how we manage ongoing support. Um, this is all an interesting um, angle on the, on the program that I'm happy to talk about. The role of the TAC and how they influence policy. That's been a, been a fun um, thing to kind of manage and, and to this collaboration that's been set up between the TAC and ADEX where we are able to kind of iteratively tweak the program. I think the success of the program has come down a lot to this Good relationship with the TAC and how we have this get, this iterate this two se this semesterly iteration with them and and I think that's a big part of the reason why this program has become as as good and as successful as it has and project management so astronomers um, there's a there's a really well established culture of project management in software engineering now and there's a lot of language around that that astronomers haven't necessarily been exposed to. So it's, there's a real opportunity here to, to bring the project management methods and culture of the software engineering community to astronomers, uh, be, because it's something that astronomers don't get a lot of training on project management. You know, we, 
we work on a lot of big projects, but we're just often just thrown into them and we kind of find our own ways to manage them. Um, there's a lot of best practices around managing the sorts of projects that we work on now. And I think there's a real opportunity here for ADAX to help the community um, learn how to manage projects a little bit better. Kind of boring stuff, but, uh, but stuff that could have a real payoff. Um, but yeah, figuring out how to, man to manage that impedance mismatch between how astronomers like to manage a project and how the software engineering community likes to manage a project has been a fun and interesting challenge. Um, one last thing I just wanted to highlight in, in, is that housed with the ADAX group at Swinburne is uh, the Gravitational Wave Data Center. So this is uh, sort of on the order of eight to nine FTEs of, of software engineering effort um, that gets, is managed sort of within the confines of the ADAX group. Um, so this has, this has been going for a couple of years now and, and consists of four main sort of core projects, GW Cloud and GW Lab and MirTime are all um, sophisticated web applications that uh, leverage the OSTAR supercomputer. The SPEAR pipeline is a real-time um, sort of alert, sort of tran tran gravitational wave transient alert system that sends alerts out for multi-messenger astronomy uh, projects. Also, we offer time and several uh, members of the Monash uh, Astronomy Group have made good, at, good use of the fact that we offer, um, GWDC offers guaranteed time through the ADEX Merit Allocation Program. Um, and we'll be doing so again this semester and in, hopefully in, in following semesters. Uh, we're also going through uh, a, a sort of reselection process for the core gravitational wave data center projects. Um, and you'll be hearing hopefully in about a month's time what the results of that selection process ha uh, have been. Um, and I think, yes, I think that was all I wanted to say today. Uh, I'll turn things over to um, Simon, and, and maybe we'll, we'll take all of your questions at, at the end of the, in the talk. Great, okay, thanks, Greg. Um, let me pull up my slides. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the optical data center uh, today and uh, touch on also briefly how we uh, interact with ADAX um, and hopefully that will be increasing over the, uh, the coming years. Um, so the Optical Data Centre is a collaboration between Data Central, uh, which is uh, through AAO Macquarie and SkyMapper at ANU. Um, so the idea is that yeah, we integrate the two uh, systems uh, that share data, uh, store and share data uh, to the community through various uh, virtual observatory services. Uh, so we host both the uh, raw data and process data from multiple telescopes, uh, mainly optical and infrared, but <clears throat> that's changing uh, as well a little bit. Um, and we're funded by AAL for two years and um, that should be extended hopefully for another two years at least. Um, so we're, as I said, we're building virtual observatory tools, uh, which are basically just ways you can uh, find your data more easily, query uh, for various things, various images, spectra, catalogs uh, in a sort of a standardized way. Uh, and so you can use the same query, same set or set very similar queries uh, across multiple virtual observatory systems. Uh, we have live ingestion um, of telescope data into uh, NCI, well that's the goal. Currently it comes to AO Macquarie, but we're just in sort of a beta mode to, to have a transfer into NCI and that's where the uh, data will be stored uh, in the longer term and, um, and all of the various backups and uh, maintenance around that. Uh, so that's primarily the AAT, uh, but we're looking to expand to other telescopes, including the Sighting Spring 2.3 meter uh, and other small telescopes um, predominantly at Sighting Spring. Uh, and the other, our other goal is to give teams better collaboration tools um, that 
particularly ones that link with data um, and allow you to manage your documentation around the, the data that you have um, and, uh, and just commute better communication. So, so we have three basic uh, tenets. We have uh, explore, collaborate and science. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but that's sort of our basic philosophy um, for uh, the optical data center. Um, and this is the team, so uh, led by myself. Uh, we've got a bunch of software engineers and uh, some astronomers turned software engineers. Um, and we now have on the team uh, someone from uh, NCI, so Systems Administration, to get things going uh, on that end. Uh, so our main goal is uh, to save the data. Uh, we have tens of millions of galaxies on the on the um, the right hand side. There you see a bunch of different surveys that we currently uh, host data for, uh, including uh, SAMI. Uh, GleamX is not publicly available, but the process data is being moved over uh, to uh, the optical data center. Uh, but also Gamma, uh, some of the more legacy surveys like Wiggles and 60F, but um, but also obviously SkyMapper, Devils, um, and uh, coming soon there'll be uh, deeper, wider, faster. Uh, we're working with Jeff Cookie and July Zhang on that one. Uh, so we have all sky coverage in, in multiple bands, primarily through SkyMapper, but also through the Gamma and Devils, uh, panchromatic data releases, uh, lots of data cubes, millions of spectra, and our goal is to save the many smaller uh, data sets from being lost. Um, certainly. I look back 20 something years to my PhD and um, the data that I, I took, it's probably sitting on DAT tape somewhere, um, but they may not be readable anymore. So uh, a lot of that data is lost and that's not even that old. Um, but so our goal is to try and uh, reverse the trend of that, but uh, not just the large surveys, but also uh, smaller sort of pilot studies and, and things like that, because they can still be very uh, useful and quite important. Uh, so what are the services that we currently provide? So we have a main web portal, which has an API uh, and a lot of um, query and search services. Uh, we, we have a lot of IVA services um, as well. Uh, and there's, there's links for all of these. We run cloud storage, so um, you can share your data with your colleagues uh, anywhere uh, around the world. They don't have to be at your home institution. Um, we do have a uh, small and uh, sort of limited Compute service, but if you need uh, not a great amount of supercomputing power, but basically uh, a large chunk of memory, say half a gig, half a terabyte of memory for uh, a week or intermittently over the course of months, we can uh, certainly support you with that. We offer that to currently the, the Magpie survey team, uh, and they're doing a lot of their data reduction and processing there. Um, and we're also looking at other a few other uh, surveys as well. So we also have a few GPUs. Uh, available eight eight GPUs available uh, in that in that system. Uh, you can have a, an internal team wiki, uh, document management, team management. So you can uh, the team decides who has access to their data, um, and that that also comes with mailing lists um, and various other uh, bits and pieces. Uh, and we do host bespoke web applications, including um, the applications that ADAX uh, have developed at the moment. Uh, we hope. We host the, the Gleam, I'll, I'll do, talk about this in a minute, but we've got something for the Gleam X team uh, and we're looking at a couple of others. Uh, and if you have one already uh, that you just don't quite know where to put it, we can also host it. And the advantage here is that it can link to data within Data Central directly. Uh, and we also have um, uh, an instant messaging service, which is very similar to, uh, to Slack and you get your own workspace. Um, but it's and it's also free, but you don't have the 10,000 message limit that Slack has in, the, in its free version. Uh, so the hosted web apps, um, we can and do su support the uh, the GleamX team. As I said, uh, we're looking at uh, soon to host the Smart Pulsar Survey tool, tool, or you can bring your own app. And as I said, you can connect the data, um, connect your, to your data in the optical data center. Um, so just uh, an example of if you have. Uh, a large data processing job, we provide a remote desktop service in the browser, um, whereby you can uh, run particularly GUI tools that can be uh, challenging otherwise. Um, and this is what we're, we're providing currently for the Magpie team. 
uh, also for the Huntsman telephoto array, uh, their, their um, low surface brightness imaging survey, and um, also students uh, as well. So this is just for things like ESO, um, the Muse pipeline is particularly useful because you basically cannot run that on your laptop. Um, it needs, I think the ESO claims that it needs 64 gig of memory, but it really, in order to, to actually process uh, data, you need probably uh, 256 gig minimum. Uh, so we provide this for the, um, for the, um, the Magpie survey team. Uh, and they're uh, using it uh, quite intensively as their data comes in now that it's coming in again. Um, okay, so let me. So, in terms of uh, virtual observatory services, we have an image access service um, that allows you to get uh, uh, cutouts from the large mosaics from the Gamma and Devil survey, uh, and also uh, 10 arc minute images from SkyMapper. Um, and, but as I mentioned, we're, we're, I may have mentioned we're looking to do mosaics of those, and you may have seen some of those on the ASA Exploder. And if you follow uh, Data Central, the Data Central account on Twitter, um, where we're doing a lot of mosaicing of uh, large field uh, images, things like uh, Centaurus A, uh, and also allowing you to do radio overlays. And I'll show an example of that in a sec. Um, we have a, a spectrum access service, which is very similar. You can get uh, spectra from many of the surveys uh, in the system, ranging from Gamma, Galar, Wiggles, uh, and Ausdes. Uh, we have a cone search service, uh, which allows you to do a cone search across all of the, uh, the Australian um, services that, uh, that are part of the virtual observatory, uh, including CASDA and MWA. Uh, and we have a TAP service, which um, is about to be uh, refreshed in the coming months. Uh, and then we also offer uh, an API, and there's some examples of this link. So I will share these slides uh, after the after the presentation. Um, so this is just an example of the the Sen A image. So this is SkyMapper um, GRI uh, data mosaic uh, across Sen A with uh, ASCAP RAX contours overlaid uh, on the top. Um, so you can do some very nice visualizations uh, and we've got a bunch of example scripts on, on how to do this uh, and we're going to be turning this into a, a, a web service as well. So basically you can say I'm interested in this object in this field size uh, and then it, um, it will go away and um, generate the, the mosaic image with, with overlays uh, as well. Uh, then we uh, can, can do the Spectra as well. So once again, we have a, a bunch of scripts. We have a spectrum viewer uh, that allows you to, to look at individual spectra uh, or galar spectra, multiple bands. But um, sometimes you might want to look at a time series of spectra. So here's an example from Ausdes. Um, and you can basically run a Python script uh, that goes and gets everything and, and plots it. And we provide example scripts uh, for various targets. Uh, and you can modify those. Um, there's also another uh, virtual observatory um, standard called HIPS, which is a hierarchical imaging uh, progressive. I can't remember exactly what it stands for now, but um, it's for, uh, allows you to, to basically do like a Google Maps kind of view, zoom in and out of, of data. It's what Aladdin uses and Aladdin Light. You may have seen those services. Um, ESA Sky, which is built on Aladdin Light, uses it um, and allows you to do a lot of really neat things. So um one of the uh, examples here is from the 60f galaxy survey an older survey um but this was something that uh someone requested that we um provide this provide access to these data so we were very happy to ingest it uh, and so you can show the spectra and then corresponding images from uh different imaging surveys whether it's sky mapper dss uh two mass uh, all wise whichever uh, you want and we once again provide uh, scripts to get you started uh, there. Then uh, when you uh, combine the, the VO services with our API uh, you can do start to get very nice interactive uh, viewers so here's an example it's not actually interactive this time but basically here you, you see uh, a log G T effective uh, temp uh, effective temperature diagram uh, of objects in Galar with a particular uh, filter and if you go uh, in the interactive, if you 
use the the scripts then you you will see you can click on each object and you'll or hover over each object and you'll see the uh the spectrum pop up uh, the spectra in each of the four um hermes bands so coming up next um we've got uh, a lot of things still still coming including um, what i'm hoping will be a very widely used service something called, we're calling a data aggregation service which basically <coughs> um, is a, a portal where you can go and put type in your favorite object resolve the coordinates and then get all of the data um, catalogs redshifts um, images spectra um, and they'll pop up here in the in the right you see uh, some of the, the spectra that uh, that we host at Data Central, but also goes and gets ESO data, uh, Gaia, uh, Wise, uh, PanStars, SkyMapper, a whole bunch of different imaging ranging from um, the Dark Energy Survey, DCAPS, uh, PanStars again, um, and then eventually we'll have LSST imaging when that becomes available uh, as well. And then you can share, you can um, so access the the images directly, or you can just view them in the the uh, sort of the viewfinder on the left. Uh, you can also uh, export the catalog data uh, for these these objects uh, into a tool like directly into a tool like uh, Topcat or Aladdin, uh, because there's a, a simple SAMP button there, which is just a, a way to communicate from your from the browser into uh, into those applications. Um, so you can see here, this is just a, a neat image of a planetary nebula that happens to have a galaxy. Um, behind it but uh, what's my next slide oh, I don't have I don't have the I have a, uh, an animation which seems to not be in this presentation um, but if you hover over the the images then it it, uh, it automatically loads the uh, the different uh, wave bands uh, this service is going to be launched soon uh, it was primarily it was originally written for the craft team which is a fast radio burst team um, uh, that was led by uh, JP uh, Marquardt uh, and is now, uh, this, is, this service is for Stuart Ryder and one of his students. So also we have pipelines as a web service. Um, this is initially for uh, AAT data taken with uh, 2DF A Omega, um, but we plan to um, expand that to whichever pipelines are available for whichever telescope data you might need. So it's basically uh, a system where you query and say, I want these data that happen to be in your telescope archive. Uh, you click a button that says reduce uh, the data. It goes and finds all the relevant calibrations uh, and runs uh, the 2DFDR uh, reduction system in the, in the background um, and produces a, uh, a science ready uh, set of spectra uh, at the end. So at the moment, as I said, this will be for 2DFA Omega, but we're looking to expand it into uh, other other instruments on the AAT and then any other uh, instruments we have or telescope data for. Um, okay, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned, we're hoping to do, well, we're planning to do image mosaics on the fly uh, very soon. So basically a, a web service where you say, um, you know, this is my object of interest or my field of interest, uh, give it a, give it a, a bounding box uh, and it will go and generate those uh, image mosaics based on SkyMapper or whichever service you, uh, whichever data that you would like to. Um, and then if you want radio overlays, uh, we can do that as well. At the moment, uh, we have uh, the Rax survey, so continuum data, but um, we are certainly open to other uh, data sets as well. Uh, we're looking to uh, integrate more with multi-wavelength uh, and multi-messenger archives. Uh, so for example, uh, CASDA, which is where a lot of the, uh, where all of the ASCAP data is hosted, um, and the gravitational wave data center that uh, that Greg mentioned uh, as well. Um, the next steps for the uh, raw telescope archive is proprietary telescope access. At the moment, unfortunately, you have to basically email us, email us to say, I need my data from six months ago, um, but soon we'll have a system where you basically just have to log in and the system will know whether you have uh, access to it or not. Uh, the data aggregation service, as I mentioned, um, and we're looking to have that as a sort of a more customizable tool where you can bring in your own uh, data services uh, and uh, configure things how you how you would like them. Uh, I mentioned the the remote desktops in the 
in the browser, but also we're looking at other systems for to bring your code near to the data, including uh, notebooks. Um, we're also very keen uh, on hosting uh, uh, queryable theory and simulation data. This is something that uh, some of you will be aware of. We put in a proposal uh, to the Australian Research Data Commons last year to get this going, but unfortunately it was not successful. So we're going to try again uh, this year. Um, but that's something that we, we think will be really useful to be, basically have the you know, theory data next to uh, observational data to allow uh, more direct comparisons uh, in a more straightforward way. Um, improved data visualization tools. Um, there's a lot of uh, scope there. Um, and we're interested in, in what would be useful uh, uh, from the community, so from you guys. Uh, so please let us know if there's a particular visualization uh, that you would like, something that you would like to be visualized, uh, or a way of visualizing something, or a particular package that might run either in a browser or in a remote desktop. Uh, and we're also uh, going to be offering a host your code in our GitLab uh, service as well. So we have a, a, a GitLab instance that we run locally um, and this will be particularly useful if you are hosting web applications uh, in our uh, in our system then they'll just basically go straight in and uh, sort of you'll have a bit more control over your uh, where your data and where your code live uh, and finally we are um, we've sort of had an internal publications and proposals reporting tool for a while but particularly the publications one um, we basically have a, a, a way to uh, scrape all of the uh, publications by anyone from a, any a, a affiliation. We currently track all affiliations, uh, all Australian affiliations. So uh, we're looking to open that up to the public soon as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Greg and Simon. Um, is there any question um, regarding either ADAX or the ODC? Maybe you can go back to the, um, to the slide um, that Greg showed about a um, couple of possible questions we could uh, discuss. All right, you're testing me here. <laughs> Just a second. Okay. So what are we doing? Can you see that? Yes. Okay. What were you wanting to see? Um, where you, um, I remember there was a slide where you listed five yeah. topics for questions. Yeah, that, that one. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned some good practices for project management, your, your fifth point. Could, could you say a bit more about that maybe? Yeah, in, in the software engineering community, there really has been a lot of activity over the last, I don't know, 20, 20 years around what is sort of broadly termed agile development. So the idea here is small, um, iterative incremental steps and, and really taking a big project, chopping it up into small bits and working systematically through that. And there's a lot of sort of there's some frameworks around ways of structuring that and um, and you know you, you can kind of go down a real rabbit hole of different frameworks and stuff like that but a lot of them work in sort of fundamentally similar ways and have a lot of common language around them things like words like product ba backlog you know the product backlog is a prioritized list of work that you work through and and a soft, like software engineers really like to have sort of well-defined increments of work um, and they want those increments of work to be prioritized and and there's a lot of kind of interesting process that you can have around making sure that that is is managed and, and kind of is done properly so I you know I, I don't have a slide deck prepared to go through all of that but there is uh, just a lot of culture here within the software community and and this really you know is growing and evolving with time but is really now in quite a mature state in that community mm -hmm. whereas in the in the science community 
it's it's a totally it's a fundamentally different job doing science. You know, astronomers. One of, one of my favorite things about when I was a research astronomer was sitting around a table with a bunch of astronomers and just knocking around ideas. Right? Oh, we could do this. Or we could do that. Or have you thought about looking at that plot? Have you thought about this? You know, a lot of oh, we could do this. We could do it, and a lot of that kind of stuff. And that's great. And I, I love that about that community, and I love that about that job. But bringing that kind of approach to a software development project is a, a good way to not uh, get very far <laughs> and, nah. be, and to be left with something that's in a chaotic and, and perhaps even broken state. And also is a good way to just drive software engineers completely crazy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So um, does that kind of flesh out what I, yeah, yeah. There? Yeah. So there's a there's a lot that we that ADEX I think could be doing to help the astronomy community to to kind of understand some some of these techniques and approaches. Um, yeah. There are things that could be brought to bear quite gen generically on on science programs, and you know you can break you can you know I read an article the other day about how the pyramids basically were developed with agile methods. So. Agile methodology isn't something new. The language around it is new. You know, mm -hmm. Agile, small, iterative, incremental approaches to, to breaking down big projects have, has been around for thousands of years. But there's a real culture now that, that can be brought um, and, you know, and you can, could be applied to how you write your papers, how you write proposals, how you manage yeah. graduate students, how you set up a conference. Um, and I think ADEX could be doing a lot to kind of help the astronomy community get up to speed on a lot of those. Um, yeah, it's great that ADEX can teach those agile practices as part of workshops. Um, so we, we try to teach them in the first instance just through the way we manage the, the merit allocation projects. So, we, so all of those projects are managed with an agile methodology. The, sophistication of that methodology kind of varies from project to project and depends on the scale of the project but mm -hmm. um, certainly the language is all there and, and and that basically at the end of the day involves working in a tightly coupled way with the science teams so you know we have fortnightly meetings with you and the idea there is that we're always checking with you and making sure that we're working on what you want us to work on that you know if we're Kind of straying off on a path that isn't where you want us to be it gives you a chance to say no 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 bring it over here or maybe the the work that we've done over the last couple of weeks has brought some new information to light and you're like whoa well if you can do that then now this seems like the priority not that and um, so that's sort of what agile development is about is is kind of working in incrementally through a problem but also working you know, it involves kind of intense communication and collaboration with the science teams. Yeah, I see. Thanks. I see there is a question by Rio. Please go ahead, Rio. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the nice uh, explanations. And I, would, I have a question about the training part. And uh, I think you had a slide saying like, yeah, you, you can provide some training through, uh, yeah, like rerun workshops. and. Yep. Um, or self-paced tutorial. But, um, so, is this like a proper like? Uh, are there any like uh, online-based workshops that are already like ready-made and uh, you can just? So, um, certainly, through the if you go to the ADEX website and look up the learning management system, yeah. um, there is ten. You know, many. I don't know. There's twenty plus um, tutorials there on everything from HDF five to Python, to AstroPy, to SQL, um, you know, there's a long list of things that are there. And if you have any ideas for anything else that you'd like to see that you think is noticeably missing, please let us know. Are there any on MPI? Uh, there might be, not sure. If there isn't, there probably should be. So yeah, that's the that's the kind of thing that we're we're really hoping to hear from the community. Um, okay. Yeah, if 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 you would, you know, so that could be 
um, a training module that we could put together. If you um, really feel like, you know, your science program needs some more HPC expertise and, you, you know, you've got a code base and it's just not delivering on your science goals and you know that, oh, you know, it needs to be faster, but I don't know how, you could propose uh, a workshop and we could, you know, put together an HPC workshop and sit down with you and look at, you know, is a GPU approach better here? Or, you know, are you CPU bound? So a GPU approach is the way to go. Or are you memory bound? So distributed computing with MPI, that's the way to go. Um, it's really, if you've got a scientifically emeritus uh, need for some training, you've got resources there through ADAX to provide it. And through this program, it can be tailored specifically to your needs. But of course, in doing that, we would be de developing material that could be applied more generally across the community, which is why um, we, we think this is, a, is an e efficient and effective model for generating uh, training material for the whole community. Thank you, it sounds very, very useful, thank you. Any other question? Um, I have a question for Simon. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the ODC was hosting a news pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. So how does it work? Do you have to provide the pipeline to the ODC and then it can run all the data? Or can I request, for example, to uh, have some archival news data on my science be reduced with that news pipeline? So if I, um, yeah. it, it's quite a manual sort of process. Basically, you log into to a remote desktop and then you run the news pipeline. And, and the, the key thing is that the machine has got half a terabyte of memory, so it can cope and lots of cores, so it can cope with uh, the requirements for that pipeline. So if you, and then to get the data in, you just basically copy it in to our cloud system and it's available in the, in the desktop environment. All right, so, so it's not just for the Gala team uh, no, no, okay. no. Okay. Oh, uh, it's not. It's currently not. It's it's sort of a a beta-ish kind of system in that we're not. We haven't made it widely uh, available, but we definitely. If you've got a good science case, or if you've got Muse data, because it's hard, it's hard to find resources for that. So um, can it be just we'd be happy archival to... data, even if I'm not the PI of those data, but public yeah. data available? Yeah. 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 For okay. Sure. That's interesting. Uh, very yeah. good to know. Um, I was also wondering how how does the um, how do the ODC services compare to say Vizier? I understand that it's quite complementary or it's kind it's of quite, similar to yeah, yeah, it's quite it's quite complementary, uh, and so we're sort of forging some links with CDS uh, yeah. as well uh, on some of the particularly the the data aggregation service that we're yes. building. It uses Vizier for some of the catalogs um, as well as the the data that we host locally uh, okay. and a bunch of others. So. That was exactly um, my follow-up questions. If we could also yeah. access the CDS uh, catalogs. Uh, yeah, to, yeah, uh, absolutely. And in fact, any different services for the same thing. Yeah. 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 So, and in fact, any. I mean, there's no point in hosting like all mm. of those catalogs, of, you know, locally when we can get them quite straightforwardly. And and the idea of that service is also if there are other catalogs or other uh, services elsewhere that uh, you would like to bring in. That will that sort of on the, the the roadmap to basically say I want this service here it is and then we just go and mm. uh, include it in and grab it grab all of the data and sort of aggregate it all together so that you can have it all in one place a bit more conveniently. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Is right. there any other question? Um, if not, let us all thank uh, Greg and Simon again. I guess it was very clear. <laughs> had very few questions. So please feel free to contact uh, Greg or Simon um, if some questions pop up later. So their email address was in CC of my email. So you can contact them that way. Uh, well, thanks again. And uh, well, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. See ya.